Nishka, shall we begin? Yes. Uh, we just need five minutes to start the live stream. All right, sure. Both our honorable speakers have joined, so the moderators may uh, start the program. Ma'am, we just got word from someone at Live Law saying that they need a minute for those live streaming to work. Should we go ahead? Yeah, yeah, we can. Can you hear me? Ma'am, we can hear you. Yes, ma'am. Just ma'am, we can hear you. Yes. We can start. Nandita, ma'am, we can't hear you. Just start with a small introduction of the uh, uh, women's uh, forum, and meanwhile, they'll start zooming. Sure, ma'am. Uh, All right. So, um, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to another uh, another edition of the Delhi High Court uh, Women Lawyers Forum Virtual Canteen. Today, uh, the topic up for discussion is about evolving a feminist jurisprudence. And our two speakers today are Justice Asha Menon, a sitting judge of the High Court of Delhi, having been elevated to the post in May 2019. And um, Nishtha Satyam, who is the deputy country representative for UN Women and has been since January 2018. Thank you and thank you for being here and welcome. Um, so before we um, actually begin discussing the evolution of feminist jurisprudence, we should establish what our understanding of a feminist jurisprudence is for the purposes, mostly for the purposes of discussion today, and essentially what it comprises, the developments that we witnessed, and its contours, basically. So um, to that end, we um, invite opening remarks from our speakers about uh, the CEDAW, uh, the Convention um, on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and uh, the feminist jurisprudence that's emerging from our courts in India. Thank you, Anushka. Um, Anushka Barua is a lawyer. She's my co-moderator, and my name is Alia Vaziri. I'm a lawyer as well. And uh, to be students all the way from Vishakha to Naftej Singh Johar. At the dawn of this new decade, my question to you is how do we widen access to gender justice and how do we, in your experience, enhance the gender responsiveness of courts? That's a kind of an omnibus question. But let me talk about what the presence of uh, of women has been in the courts. Because the last uh, question that you asked was about the environment, isn't it? About how women. So I must say that in all these years, uh, <clears throat> from 1986, in fact, if you see the college days, uh, law studies, uh, we didn't have too many women joining the, the law courses. And um, today, it's such a great thing to see that primarily, you know, the girls are opting for law. In many classes, you will find predominantly girls, I feel, in some colleges. And uh, in our own uh, judicial service, if you see in Delhi, there are certain batches where uh, more than 60% are women. And when I joined, the, the groups that joined or the batches that joined before me had two or three women judges. And we have moved from there to, as I said, more than 60% or 70% being women. So that's been one of the major changes for, if you see the presence of women, at least in our judiciary, I cannot say the same for the entire country, probably. 
and uh, the High Court or the Supreme Court probably. But then, what one needs to also appreciate simultaneously is that unless you have a pool of resources from where you can draw people, just to say that you need women, you need to create an environment for them, becomes meaningless. Unless you have an actual, supposing I say I want to keep 30% of uh, the force for women, but I get only about 10%. There's no meaning to it because this is a, a professional studies. There is a certain degree that is required. So definitely women have come forward now to take up law as a subject. You can't say that across the country. And therefore that, that discrimination because there's a lack of presence, I will not be able to accept immediately. Then let us come to the role, say, about the, okay, this was the judges. Now, being a woman judge definitely entails a certain regard and respect. And we are definitely insulated from snide remarks with due respect to the male lawyers that our generation used to face if they were practicing in the uh, courts. A woman who do well, uh, would immediately be pegged down by snide remarks that because she's a woman, the judges, because of course uh, there was a disproportionately high number of male judges, so probably that is how they used to view. From there, you have today, even in our own court, where, uh, where I, was just, I was sitting with Justice Kohli, we were two women judges, our court masters were women, and the lawyers arguing are also women. So there has been a sea change in uh, participation of women, I should say, in the judicial administration, whether as lawyers or, or as judges. I've also seen the different roles. Uh, immediately when I had joined the uh, profession, there was an attitudinal problem and most women, uh, but uh, I think those women were more feisty and therefore they used to assert uh, their right to participate, to make their submissions, etc. There came a time in between where I noticed that young lawyer, women lawyers were generally carrying files and looking good. And it used to upset me no end because that is not what I equate a woman's uh, we should look good, no doubt about that. But at the same time, that's not our definition. We are not defined by our looks. So that happened in between. But then again, that changed and we had great uh, women lawyers coming forward like uh, Rebecca, for instance, in the criminal side. Uh, she, I mean, I think she's a pioneer because uh, Women doing criminal practice at that point of time was really a, a, a commendable effort. Now, when you talk about what the criminal, uh, when I say that, I also say that there was generally a protective attitude towards us women when we were also seeing the, you know, as uh, magistrates, we would be. Um, kind of, uh, oh, you don't need to sit on a duty or you cannot, I mean, you know, don't need to uh, go outside the court premises to remand anyone. And with great pride, I say that it was our batch, we, we broke all those uh, predetermined not notions, so to speak. We sat for duty, we used to sit, uh, we, we, if we had to go out and um, Remand, even terrorists, we, we have done that with no form. Uh, trials have taken place where ordinarily there are yeah, a threat to life. Women judges have really dealt with that. So when we talk of the environment, I can only say that uh, with our own efforts, I think we have managed to remove 
very preconceived notions and possibly uh, encouraged other women to come forward possibly and uh, take a chance in this field too and do as well as anybody else male or female doesn't matter now the jurisprudence aspect is a larger question what exactly would you like me to talk about in the jurisprudence how would you like the other speaker to say something before i again open my mouth Ma'am, uh, since we are inviting opening remarks, let's uh, let's introduce Nishtha. Go to her, and then we'll come back to you with a full fledged Definitely. question Definitely. from jurisprudence. Definitely. Okay. So, Nishtha, just uh, to uh, open up the discussion, I think we should uh, ask, what is the CEDAW? I mean, we understand what it stands, what the acronym stands for, and it it does give a sense of what it entails, but I don't think. We're as familiar with the nuance or with the detail that it exists, or even one of its, I mean, more salient features, which is that it builds on substantive equality and state obligation. And it's I, the idea behind it really is to eliminate the more granular and structural inequalities that uh, women face, and not necessarily what is glaring. So my question to you then is, um, what exactly does the CEDAW bring to our domestic human rights discourse? Mute. Sorry, two years into the pandemic, I'm still learning to mute myself. Uh, uh, but I think it's an absolute privilege and honor to be on board, even to be on the same uh, platform as Justice Menon. I think it's a privilege for me uh, to even have this opportunity and to also be speaking to much younger feminists, uh, which is where I truly believe uh, the energy lies, particularly those who have taken up the role of uh, substantive equality and justice in the country. Uh, now let's understand, before we get to what CEDAW really provides for, let's understand uh, CEDAW's contribution in the history of the women's movement across the globe. Uh, before CEDAW was a convention, was a declaration. Uh, it was just about that era when, uh, if you look at the own movement of gender, even within the UN, uh, let me remind you that in 1945, uh, there were only two women who were, there were only four women among the 160 signatories to the UN's founding document. Uh, and only two women who were present at that conference made sure uh, that the words, that the word women and the principle of equality between sexes was included in the founding document. It almost took 20 years after that uh, to see uh, particularly a convention uh, in the 1970s, when we saw the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination, which I believe is a, truly a watershed movement for advancing the declaration that we had earlier, or, but also the discourse on gender. Uh, there are about four points or two, if I may, I don't want to call them features, but four points that really make uh, CEDAW a pioneering instrument for human rights for women. One. Uh, that it recognized the centrality of non-discrimination to the equality of, of women. Uh, two, it included for the very first time private acts in the definition of discrimination, which means it articulated articulate customary practices, stereotype roles, uh, and women as features to be eliminated. Three, it overturned uh, the formal approach to uh, equality and in its place established the norm of results for equality of, uh, of outcomes. In other words, it, was, it, it spoke about equality for the first time in real terms. So if you see these three contributions, particularly the second one, which is uh, really including private acts in the, de in the definition of discrimination, we're actually talking about a convention that helped us leapfrog, uh, take giant steps uh, really, uh, from a from a normative perspective uh, on equality, so I'm going to stop there and come back to see Dom. All right, so uh, while we're at the topic of CEDAW right now, I think maybe we should just stay here. So now that we have an understanding of what the CEDAW is, why it's important, what, what its salient features are, um, I think the question that sort of comes to the fore now is 
is there a gap in its legal know-how because while it is a pioneering instrument and it does um, and it does do a lot of things which had never been done before but is there a gap in its legal know-how and if this lacuna does exist how how should we bridge it i think there is a is this, sorry is this question to me yes 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 which i okay so uh, is there a gap in the legal know how i think any gap in know how usually is because we want to maintain that gap on in know how you know the world has found a way to solve the problems it wants to solve uh, and i think the argument that you know gender equality is good for all is all progressive works for everybody is is a slightly overstated is, is slightly o- overrated statement because if you actually see gender equality is going to threaten and redistribute the concentration of power from one half of humanity into the other half of humanity and we're still speaking in binaries so i think the legal know how can be attributed because we wanted uh, to 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 maintain that legal know how it is also about how seriously countries that are signatories have taken um, uh, have uh, have taken to it i think you know as somebody who's really worked on cedo reporting for a very very long time i think uh, the legal now know how is very very correlated to political and bureaucratic will uh, of of a spreading know how but today i think as you and women what we're trying to uh, to do is to democratize the instrument of cedo i think uh, is to is for youth to understand what cedo means for them to use that as a charter of asks from the government to use that as a charter of a uh, framework of accountability uh with that government so yes is there a gap in know how yes absolutely is there a gap in in using the instrument to report against progress of women and girls uh, i think there is a, the world is yet to reach a place where there is complete bureaucratic and political will to do so uh and let me remind you that even as per uh, you know as per the sustainable development goals which is the set of goals that countries have come together to set for themselves as per their own benchmarks and indicators not a single country in the world as of today can claim themselves to be a gender equal country so is there something anybody is going to be thrilled to report against uh, well absolutely not so uh, so i think you know instead of stopping at is there a legal gap in know how let's break that down to why and what can be done uh the immediate need of the hour as somebody who re- as you and women is to also democratize and popularize and socialize the convention uh with you is also to invest in younger people to use this uh, as a framework of accountability uh with their peers with their uh, with their states uh and and of course with those who they they vote for Thank you, Nishtha. Justice Menon, uh, to come to you now. Uh, Nishtha spoke about dem- democratizing the convention. She gave us a bit on what really is the CEDA. Now, to build upon that and um, sort of view that in tandem with our uh, Indian jurisprudence, how do you think that? There- There is a possibility of democratizing, socializing, just contextualizing CEDO into our uh, into the framework that we have, the legal framework right now in India. Yeah, I think uh, we uh, have a sound legal framework, but uh, when it comes to the working out at sometimes very ground level, you feel that there is some differences. Uh, occurring uh, on account of how people view situations how people deal with uh, an issue how it strikes them which in turn would kind of uh, be dependent on from where they are what has been their life experiences so i do not know whether you know constant expanding of statutes would really matter i i don't know because see when we look at it we have got uh, enough laws to protect women in the home in the office in the uh, you know against uh, bodily injury whether domestic or criminal like uh, sexual offenses and um, we have uh, beneficial legislation for uh, taking care of uh, women even if they are uh, you know, for instance there are uh, rules when you have when you engage women labor 
then you have to provide them, uh, say, a toilet within uh, 10 meters. You have to provide them with a room where they can engage with their children, a crash or for lactating mothers. These are all there in our statute books. But you go to any uh, labor site, you're not going to find these. So I do not know whether, you know, adding on to the pile of laws, again, maternity. The law says yeah, that you can give them maternity leave. But even if they are, you know, they can be waiver, they can be a professor. And yet there, there was a case in which we had to deal with a professor being term, I mean, an assistant professor being terminated because she went off on maternity leave. So it's not that there is, I mean, how, how could the, a, a university or a college take such a decision? Um, it, it kind of, uh, and then, as I say, if you go by my experience in our time, we had the maternity leave in the government service. That was for three months, strictly saying, one and a half months before and one and a half months after. And uh, by the time, of course, my turn came, things had improved. You could take the three months as you wished. And today it has improved to such an extent that not only can you take paternity leave for six months, but you also have a total two-year period child care pe uh, leave, which you can take up to the child is, uh, uh, of the age of 18, which would include for situations like exams. So we have moved. We have moved tremendously. But when it comes to the uh, implementation, if there is a, a slight... Uh, uh, not a slight, sometimes you find a major, uh, you know, uh, what do you call that? Uh, a ma yeah. major. <laughs> My word that is coming is a gorge because I've just come from the mountains. With that deep thing there, which, you know, you wouldn't know how to bridge that. And. Uh, so I don't think that, you know, we need much more. In fact, I think overall, India has uh, responded to many of the uh, international obligations, many of them. And it usually jumps into uh, signing off for all these kind of uh, conventions. And they pass the law also, because once you sign on uh, the dotted line, you have to pass laws. But when it comes to the implementation, you will look left and right and you will see what went wrong. So th there is, um, like we came across, again, I can't give names of those cases, where uh, what happened was a, a question of indiscipline in a force. But in the indiscipline in the force, the questions that are being asked of the girl, of a uh, Lady supposedly caused, called as a witness against the man who's accused of indiscipline are very personal and very offending kind of questions. Now, because she came to the court, we were able to see what kind of questions are being asked and we, we, we could take corrective action. But just imagine how much can you go on looking into or how many people will come to court for these kind of things. So, it's the implementation. When you know that wherever it is the basic dignity of a woman has to be maintained, come what may. The way you question, the way you have to... Uh, now, that doesn't mean that a woman, because she's a woman, will be exempted from all disciplinary action or criminal action or she's above the law. No question of that. But in those circumstances, how do you deal with a woman? How do you deal with a woman witness? These are all at the basic level. So human rights are there plenty and uh, all kinds of uh, laws are there in plenty. But, and that's where we have to address. How do we address that part? Thank you, ma'am. Nishtha, too, I have a quick follow-up question from what uh, Justice Menon recent just said. Um, the mainstream definition and understanding of access is different 
it differs from a woman let's say living in delhi or uh, or let's say living in some other part of the country now we have to understand access uh because women are not a homogenous group something that you always say now in light of this and in light of understanding what cdo is and justice menon uh explicitly saying that you know we have the statute the statute is in place and it does a lot the gap however is it is in its implementation to build on that whose agency whose empowerment should we seek to build from the perspective of access whose access are we talking about how does it differ for for women and how are we to bridge this this gap that uh, ma'am was just recently talking about thanks alia i think there are multiple questions bundled uh, in in that one question is whose access are we talking about how do we build that access uh, again uh, you've already made certain points uh, and i think justice benen is also very effectively uh, pointed out that we are a very affirmatively legislated country there is no dearth of legislation and if we could add more it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't add much uh, the problem really is you know most of our laws uh, which are very very sound uh, have a uh, have seen a setback in enforcement and i think that's where the problem really is and i think this is this is obvious i think we all know it we all understand it we all agree with it we all also see it in our in, in our daily lives uh now even as as per you know the the fundamental problem that at least we've had as the un and working is to ensure uh access to justice and what does access to justice really mean uh, access is one availability uh to is access and when you say access those parameters are fundamentally different for women because when you say uh, access to justice there is a uh, you know mobility uh access to resources voice access you know for now uh, uh, let me let me share a small example of the pandemic uh you know with the first phase of the pandemic just in the first 10 days of the lockdown we saw that there was a dramatic a uh, difference in how women were reporting um in how we're reporting uh, domestic uh, domestic violence you see a lot of the complaints that were otherwise over the phone were now online complaints in fact a large percentage were online complaints so the moment you talk about the changing nature uh, of access to justice is very important when you say online well what does that mean that you need the internet you need a smartphone or you need um access to a laptop now imagine all of that for a woman based out of somewhere in guwahati or for a woman who's not based out of delhi or even for urban poor who are based out of delhi so i think the problem of access today when we speak about women is multi dimensional it is also a very very intersectional problem where it is not just a problem of gender it is a intersection of gender caste creed uh, geographical location uh, you know education barriers and so many more other things so uh, i think uh, it's it's important to understand that when we are arguing for a more gender equal world the easiest thing would be to ask for uh, a couple of more laws uh, but that's not really where the problem is the problem i agree and complete convergence uh, with justice men is in the problem of convergence uh, and the moment you talk about uh, you talk about enforcement and implementation uh, we have to understand that when we talk about the lack of implementation we are not talking about the failure of one institution we are not talking about the failure of one person we are talking talking about a systemic failure in the delivery of justice where uh, uh, where you know civil society people their awareness law enforcement agencies have all had an equal role to play so whose life would we have to change of course we would have to change women's life and their access to justice how would we do that it is not going to happen by going back and putting putting the onus of this change on one stakeholder because this is a systemic multi dimensional failure uh, and we have to look at an intersectional response to a multi dimensional failure and i would think that the entire system uh, the entire chain of providing justice has to be strengthened uh, from really gender sensitizing judiciary gender sensitizing law enforcement uh uh even small stereotypes you know uh, like for example let me give you an example from our work on urban development when we were really looking at the smart cities mission you know we had to put up put up a huge fight we we put up all these you know, all these messaging in uh, on you know sharing work at home uh 
uh, and we realized that none of the male toilets actually had a nappy changing station. So even if the man wanted to so share work at home and take the child and not put it on the woman, public infrastructure reinforced a certain stereotype. So when you think of when you think of a response to a multidimensional failure, you you or a systemic failure, you have to think of all stakeholders. So here we're talking about urban development and planning. Here we're thinking about think about thinking or preconceiving about what a why should a highway look different for women? Because indeed, public infrastructure is consumed differently by men and women. How are public places consumed different uh, by men and women? Long, long chain links for which we have to play that role of convergence, bringing people on the same. One of the stakeholders that hold and say a couple of links, which is which is the problem for gender equality because it is not a linear problem, and therefore it does not lend itself to a linear solution unlike many many other things where you know you can give me 50 billion dollars and i can vaccinate half the country but gender inequality doesn't work like that uh it it, it it has to be working at all levels and with all people thank you nishtha um now that you have mentioned the crux of the matter now that you've mentioned a gender sensitization curriculum or a gender sensitization training uh, i'm going to come to that segment largely owing to the fact and also referring to what you just said that we are an affirmatively legislated country what is an ideal action plan to build on information capacity and awareness within the legal framework we are going to bank on the assumption that these are the pillars of gender justice and from here on how do we characterize the need and define the need for a gender sensitization curriculum so uh, yeah so uh, ma'am asha ma'am we would like to uh, direct the next question to you so in your um, introductory remarks you uh, you touched upon the strides that women in the law have already taken and the i mean the whatever the mark change that we have seen so far so just to sort of link to that and also make a shift from women on one side of the law to women on the other side of the law so how would we recognize and ameliorate the gender based prejudices that hinder the administration of justice and i'm not simply talking about um, i mean uh, hinder the administration of justice in the sense that say the stereotyping of a prosecutrix or something along those lines and i don't simply mean those kind of prejudices which are larger and more immediately palpable but we're also talking about um the uh, the quieter and more insidious ways in which such a prejudice operates and um essentially i'm asking that is there merit in the argument that a gender sensitization curriculum for the bar for law students for the judicial academy would that help um with would that help in witnessing a decline in such a uh, prejudice in the operation of such prejudice most certainly i would say so you see um how many times in all these moot courts that these wonderful colleges have are there any issues that are relevant to women being debated left right and center you have commercial law you have i have seen one criminal law also it was just very astonishing for me to see that at least you know for criminal law point is being but how and uh, i at least i haven't come across any issue that relates to women's issue of a, of a kind uh you know whether it was the uh, whether it is a wrong decision in a rape case or the change in law for maintenance or the inheritance rights that uh, women have been given in ancestral property and so on and so forth you know these are never issues to be in a moot court irrelevant company so how are they going to even uh, consider these issues when you come to a practice uh, they you know the, the the young minds are then channelized in a particular way so whereas of course definitely one could say that the the current generation or whatever the people all of yours so many years younger to me i am actually lost in this youth i should say but still with um, and so i shouldn't be taken as being opinionated by the youngsters thinking that i i mean i am not uh, up to 
the modern trends. But whatever it is, I do believe that at least currently, uh, there is, at least in law schools and all, there's a mutual regard for uh, um, for uh, the gender without introducing, uh, you know, if a person is gen, I don't know how to put it. You see, uh, bad-mouthing a woman is not such a very common thing now. You don't know a woman, and uh, but you, you find that woman is speaking to another gentleman, and you don't like it, then you bad mouth her. That was our generation. Today, of course, it is worse in the sense that you get thrown with acid and you get thrown with a, a physical harm and injury. That's another part of it. But more or less, what I meant was that whereas understanding a woman in all these uh, institutions, there is enough being spoken about uh, equality, equality, equality. But issues are never highlighted. Now, when young lawyers come again, they do not know how they should be addressing a woman. I remember once, long years ago in my youth, there, there, was, a, uh, there was a case on the 498A, is that is uh, cruelty for dowry going on. And one lawyer, of course it was a male, male lawyers on both sides, the male lawyer asked this woman complainant, uh, some. is one of the methods of cross-examination. So, uh, in our um, uh, legal system, you have an adversarial legal system in which uh, a cross-examination of witness, the evidential value we have to attach to the statements made are all very important. And one of the skills of the lawyer is how to, uh, not just a woman generally, of, a, of any um, witness is sometimes to browbeat them, sometimes to ask them this kind of questions so that they get irritated and the next question uh, they will falter. And that benefit you will receive. So I would call, uh, you see, these things are not for me uh, to say, uh, you know, why is the lawyer cross-examining or not? Why are they trying to get benefit of the, of the provisions of law for the benefit of the client? The law is there and lawyers are there only meant to uh, help uh, uh, the clients and they have a duty to them. So I have no, no issues with all of this. But these kind of questions, probably a man would think it's a big joke. It's a joke. The lawyer wouldn't have meant it. That was not a serious question. But for me, it was an offending kind of a question, which was offensive to the woman who is complaining of a matrimonial disarmament situation where she was troubled. So what I meant to say is that how much do you sensitize? How and where do you start? According to me, when you when you are in the law schools, in the law schools, that's where you start. Not in the judicial academy. The Judicial Academy, of course, is always concerned with these issues and have always done the best it can to get people out of, uh, uh, you know, stereotyped uh, presumptions about people. And they have, uh, and we are all sincere, as judges, we are all sincere to uh, improve ourselves and do what we can so that our delivery of justice is uh, more objective and has barely any subjective element because you're a human being, you may still have a subjective element. If I had the subjective element, that's why I chastised the lawyer. So um, those kind of things, we cannot eliminate everything. So that, that is something that I, I would feel that in the curriculum of the colleges, uh, maybe up to the school, you are only trying to teach them that, you know, people are people no matter what. 
and you must respect everyone. And there's a value attached to every life, every ability, every work, all that you can give to the school. But when it comes to the professional about which we are more concerned, the law schools must take some effort in this regard and try to either you know, discuss uh, legal issues relating to women, how do you handle, how will you uh, question, and what are the basic things you should always keep in mind when you're dealing with a woman litigant. Now, so then when they become lawyers or they become judges, they're not really, if they, their normal attitude is what they have already learned in the colleges. So this is what I, I would feel. And uh, as far as uh, uh, stereotyping of uh, women, yes, it does. There are such uh, occasions when we do falter and we like to go, we may say a woman who may be talking very loudly in the court, uh, oh, she must be a crook or a woman. So this poor accused there must be the but we may not realize that that poor woman is shouting on top of her voice because that is the only way she thought she would learn. So we don't know, but whether we have that much of uh, patience or uh, you know atmosphere in the court, um, it's it's another you know big issue. What is the what is the environment we can provide in a court of law uh, to make a woman at ease? A woman may come to a uh, to a court complex, uh, not like in Delhi, but in some place from the village, does it occur to the people that she may have to come with small children the entire day spent in the court complex without food, water, in no waiting room for women? These are all questions of access. And today, of course, most court complexes are providing for these things, but at one point of time, these were non issues. So, infrastructure. When designing infrastructure, women's needs, again, not uppermost in the mind of anybody. And, uh, you know, when you say that it was the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court had to come in and say that the lack of uh, toilet facilities for women, therefore she can uh, go into any restaurant or hotel and use the facility there. Why, why should the Supreme Court, is that the jurisdiction of the courts to going to these needs, but then that is what happened. Because uh, men are free birds or animals or whatever, but uh, women can, can't be so free. So there are difficulties, there are issues, and unless a woman is on board in all these things, or a person who is sensitive enough to understand these issues, there will be problems even in infrastructure. So, now, even when the in, you know when you're dealing with the, with the question of giving the benefit of certain rules and regulations or the law to a woman, many times prejudice comes in, and there is a reason for this. If the co-workers, for instance, think that the woman is taking advantage of all childcare leave and not doing the work, then they become antagonistic to that woman. Similarly, if you see the promise to marry cases, there are so many of them. Some of them are basically you know, exploitative. So the judge may, after seeing 10 cases of that kind, the 11th may be a genuine case, but there'll be a doubt. So the, the, there is a fallout of these kind of uh, repeated actions that you know cause a certain stereotyping on account of the experience within the judicial setup. So how do you eliminate that? That's a larger question. Whether you know, uh, for in, even if you see these uh, uh, huge number of cases where teenagers have eloped, eighteen years is a is a deadline. Uh, you go to the juvenile justice board, there's so many of them. At that age, they were exploring their uh, uh, you know, relationships. And then the father of the girl complains and the boy goes to the, uh, into the system. So there are many, um, many issues where, and then of course, they, they, they respond and they try to take a more humane view of these kind of things. 
for the benefit of the girl as well as the boy. So there are, you know, how cases come before the courts also causes certain kind of response from the court. So how you eliminate that, that I don't think sensitization is any uh, possibility. I don't see that. Because if a case comes to a lawyer, the lawyer is bound to death to build some case for the client, isn't it? So I don't know how we can handle that. That is uh, for you all to work out, I think. Thank you, ma'am. Nishtha, to come to you, before I ask you my next question, I want to weave together the threads of two very important things you've said. You've said that CEDO is important and relevant because it incorporates the principle of women's rights and equality into the provisions of international law. Earlier, when you were speaking about access, you defined access, or in my limited understanding, what I understood was when we say access, we mean amplifying access to resources in education and ease, easing decision making powers which comes with uh with with economic empowerment now within the larger periphery of gender equality and building capacity the capacity measures have recently named within this larger periphery of gender equality what role do you think gender sensitization plays or a gender sensitization curriculum plays also um we have evidence, we have comparative analysis from countries like Luxembourg, Greece, Thailand, where a gender training has been successful. Um, as ma'am was, as Justice Menon was saying earlier, at, for people in, in law schools at an early age, would you say there is enough evidence for us to bank on the presumption that not only do we need it, a training for, uh, do we need it, but it is also likely to yield fruit for law enforcement officers? So again, uh, I think there are a couple of bundled questions, Alex. Let me let me kind of uh, disintegrate that into smaller pieces. Uh, number one, the first, let's look at the word gender sensitization. Uh, I think for me, uh, I think it's time we're in 2021. Uh, it's very important to move from the words gender sensitization to gender responsive, because I think the principle of gender neutrality. Uh, which means that I, as a court, will respond, or I, as a individual, will respond, irrespective and not on the basis of your gender. Uh, it, uh, yes, was in work once, and was what we were aspiring for at one point in time. Uh, the jurisprudence that we are looking for right now is gender responsive legislation or gender responsive urban development plans, which doesn't, which which essentially means that it responds acknowledges the differential needs that you may have as a woman or a representative of a certain community so i think it's very important for us to move from gender sensitive legislation which is on the principle of neutrality because mostly if it is not for women it is usually against women it is the same principle of oppression everywhere else uh, uh, towards more gender responsive legislation so the, so the and, and I know it may seem as nomenclature, it may seem as vocabulary, but when you're uh, really cementing the discourse on, on human rights, vocabulary plays a very, very important part because it defines what you're asking for. Uh, two, uh, you know, let me reflect on the question of should we be investing in something? Will it be useful or not? Uh, it's very surprising that, you know, we've, we've probably never as individuals, as professionals, tempted to measure the return on investment for any other investment as much as we make on gender. Uh, you know, today you, you, uh, 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 you, you have a conversation on reservation for women in a certain, in a certain sense, the first conversation that comes to you. So, you know, you, you get a lot of women who don't deserve to be there, but still be there. Well, that is on the presumption that every man who's there deserves to be there. That is highly questionable any which way. So uh, I think we are trained to question investments in gender uh, because we we are all products of a certain uh, of a certain setup. Have we found it to be useful? Now let me uh, let me reverse and flip the coin. Uh, have we found it to be not useful? Uh, or, uh, it's, it's it's in in any which way not going to damage uh, what we have other than threatening patriarchy, which is damaging to a large part of the world. Uh, uh, and I think we have enough data to say 
that uh, that there is a certain patriarchal system, whether it be the court, whether it be the UN, whether it be any kind of institution. We are all products of the oldest institutions of the world and are customized to thinking like that. And I think there is merit in questioning and challenging uh, that patriarchy. Uh, if you look at a very wonderful recent study that the Harvard Business Review had done in 2017, they actually analyzed oral arguments in the Supreme Court of 15 of the biggest countries uh, for 15 years. Uh, 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 and every single uh, and every single year, they noticed that with more women coming into court, uh, even female justices are are interrupted twice as much uh, by their counterparts and colleagues as compared to the male colleagues. You see that even seniority, uh, the, 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 the study puts forward a very, very interesting fact, which probably would not work uh, in, uh, in any other system where discrimination, uh, uh, discrimination is a strong word, but interruption, which is what uh, the one parameter that they measure based, uh, uh, based on gender has 30 times more the influence than seniority. Uh, uh, and therefore, I think there is enough dev evidence on the table to see that we need more gender equal workplaces, of which the judiciary is one, the UN is one, and we're all making efforts. Uh, it's also very, very important for justice delivery to ensure that we rid ourselves of the stereotype. We've had a lot of judgments in recent history. We've had a lot of cases in recent history where you see stereotypes. You even see a prototype of how a victim should be behaving. Uh, of, uh, of how a, a survivor of, of violence should be behaving. And that's a very typecasted, uh, you know, you should be sorrowful, you shouldn't be partying after that, uh, you should be resentful about that. So you see, from smaller to bigger instances, you see the role of stereotypes, you see how they limit our ability to deliver justice. So to your question, should we, making, should we be making that investment in law schools? Absolutely. Should we be making that... Uh, 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 you know that investment across uh, across all all levels. Absolutely, it's, sometimes it is too late to invest, but it's never bad to invest. Uh, uh, and I think uh, we have enough evidence to to show and to provoke us, both real life, otherwise uh, to, to encourage us uh, to, to make that investment for gender responsive environments. And again, as uh, Justice Menon said, uh, while we use the word infrastructure and we conceive it only to be a room, a toilet, a corridor. But infrastructure, soft infrastructure, also includes the environment in which women and men perform their duties uh, about that colloquial con corridor conversation that may make them uncomfortable, about what they think their success is going to be at a certain argument. And if you go through that HBR study, it talks about so many examples where women as, uh, as, though, uh, as at the highest, and even women as advocates have over, over years uh, uh, in fact, uh, over years, learned to, uh, to to phrase their arguments more politely uh, to to be uh, to be accepted. In fact, it it has a huge argument on how the only thing that really helps women counter uh, gender discrimination is the length of tenure. Uh, only to say that women learn over a period of time to see what's working and what's not. Uh, and unfortunately, what's working is again a lot of uh, what I see uh, is adjustment to the system to be working and to make sure that you navigate through that system. I've done it myself uh, as, as, a, as a young leader, as a young feminist, which is the art of learning to be polite so that you can get your point through. Uh, and I think uh, the world would be a very, very different place if we invested in gender responsive works, workplaces and gender responsive ecosystems, which is not just training uh, functionaries, not just training people at the front line, also improving infrastructure, also uh, also setting very clear boundaries of what is acceptable or not. Uh, and uh, sometimes that major change can happen in a single moment. I'm sure when Justice Menon um, immediately responded to the question before the advocate did, there's a good lesson in for that advocate to, of what to say and what not to say. So you never repeat that uh, in front of Justice Menon ever again. And I think that's the benchmarks we want to set. But unfortunately, right now we're setting that benchmark on basis of discretion, on, ba uh, on the basis of how evolved uh, uh, we, we, we are, uh, or some, some of us are who are in that situation. I think we have to in in ensure that the individual change that we are experiencing has to be institutionalized. Uh, and uh, we move from the individual to institutional. Uh, that's when we're probably we be setting a cementing 
the basis for longer lasting change. Uh, because uh, the one thing that I do, and we've seen through the pandemic that is extremely hurtful and also very, very depressing is uh, one of the largest gains to have been reversed and one of the quickest gains to have been reversed is the gains that we made on equality. Uh, it's the gains that we made on gender equality. Uh, it's also the most threatened area uh, uh, because it's easier to go back. And, and I think if we were to cement it, we'll have to move from individual change, uh, from individual-led change, or we'd have to transition from individual-led change to institution-led change. Can I just uh, say something before a question comes, or are we yeah, any other time? Of course, ma'am. Please go ahead. Uh, since I uh, this is a forum of women lawyers, and uh, the lawyers generally are, I, I do not know. That's why I, I have to say it. Uh, and forgive me if you have already done it. But you see, uh, in, in most um, uh, areas of work, employment, a woman is at a disadvantage because sometimes she has to make a choice of having a family and uh, having a career. Now, it's a very difficult choice that is thrust on the woman because every woman has a right to have a family. I mean, it's not as if it's a questionable uh, kind of a situation. We are all part of families and we, have, we know that if a woman becomes a mother, she has a certain joy attached to it. So lawyers, Firstly, they take a little time in establishing practice. Every lawyer does, man or woman. And there are supportive systems there. So if she takes a hiatus to bring up her children, say to the age of five, so you assume that she gets out of the circuit at age 27, 28, 30 maybe, and she comes back to the system in, at age 35. There is no handholding there for her. Neither for the period of those five years when she is without work and she's with her. And there is nothing like a bridge to allow her to come back and start where she left. If it's an off, it's like our employment, we know after a year's leave, you come back, you come back to your seat, you do your job and your promotion takes place. But a lawyer's uh, situation is not so. So I don't know whether the, the, the lawyer's association uh, is asking for that kind of support system. Uh, when the lawyer community has demanded from the government certain advantages and uh, certain monetary assistance for lawyers as a whole class, whether a class for women has been carved out because their needs are a little different. And that's where uh, what Nishtha says, responsiveness, that's what is responsiveness. You're sensitive, so you are also part of the big tribe. You're not going to be excluded, but whether the inclusion is really effective and meaningful. So don't know whether you have... Uh, thought on those lines. If not, please do, all youngsters. Yes, ma'am. Uh, just to, I mean, basically, what essentially what you have said, it has been a prevalent theme through the entire discussion, even through what Nisha was saying about uh, the importance of environment and um, action that is actually, you know, that is felt. And because a lot of what we've discussed is about the gap between form and substance, because there, is, there can be endless progress made in the letter of the law and there is because, for example, even what we've been talking about maternity benefits, India's maternity benefit laws are, I mean, the maternity benefit leave that is granted is well beyond, say, what the ILO prescribes. So on paper, things do look very good, but it does not necessarily reflect in action. So and, and that is something that we've discussed a lot. So um, just in terms of that, would you say that there's any justification in the notion that like to have a genuinely effective feminist jurisprudence or something that is genuinely gender responsive as we've been discussing, do you think that's beyond our present legal framework or do you think that it is possible within this framework as well? 
That's to me. Yes, no, I've already mentioned, you know, that uh, as far as the legal framework is concerned, I I do believe that it is quite adequate. It is where you know that the implementation seems to be a little faulty. Yes. And where even implementation is more or less in place, sometimes certain prejudices, if you may, for want of a better word, may creep in because of the court experiences that happen. So thank you, ma'am. So I'm one for not multiplying the law. Then thereafter, you will have to sit and uh, kind of reconcile those laws. It doesn't really... Because, for instance, if you see the 498A cases, ought to have actually reduced somewhat with the protection of women from domestic violence. Because that's such a wonderful act which gives so much of, you know, scope, whether, whether it is... Uh, emotional, financial, physical, just protection orders or uh, residential order, residence orders or monetary help or, you know, I've heard of a case where a young girl who wanted to uh, educate herself uh, filed a, an application under that act against the father for financial help to study. And yet we are focused on 498A because 498 has a criminal uh, implication where the husband and the family members will go, will, you know, face uh, a jail term. So, and then, so sometimes, you know, a fault, faulty cases can lead to a large number of failures in that head. Whereas if you access the correct law, you would probably have high success rates, which would have an impact generally on society. So if you have a, you know, 60% failure rate in 498A, but you have a 90% success rate in the domestic violence cases, the family will understand what will come of them if they don't behave. I mean, that's my point of view, but uh, it's for lawyers to build cases and for judges to decide as best as they can. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Nishtha, to come to you in terms of concluding remarks and uh, essentially building on what Justice Menon just said, to circle back to our starting point, something Anushka also just mentioned, is there trouble or uh, um, not that we've established there is trouble in translating progress reform in the letter of the law and to its reflection in action. My question to you the, right now is, in light of everything said during the course of this discussion, how do we move beyond charitable conversations surrounding women? I know you've largely answered this question, but just in terms of um, diversifying the conversation, having in place concrete measures as opposed to stopgap solutions. This is my question to you. Thanks, Alia. I think I've largely answered that question, particularly in the context of what you're doing, because, of course, one could boil down the universe and say, well, we need a national national plan uh, on, on ending our violence. We need a plan to set de for gender responsive legislation. Again, uh, uh, let's first uh, talk about the fundamental problem or the big gap in what we're doing. I think, you know, this entire approach of, you know, watering the leaves and starving the roots is something that we should be thinking about again and again. 90% of our efforts on gender are towards solving symptomatic barriers to equality because it's too hard to get to the structural barriers of, uh, of equality. Uh, and I think, uh, 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 and again, I think, uh, you know, the problem is also how state plans are conceived. The problem is also uh, in how, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the vision that we have. Uh, and therefore, I think sustainable development goals gives you that 15 year uh, framework to really look at transitioning from symptomatic barriers of inequality to structural barriers to equality. And I think that's a huge shift. Uh, two is a point that we've picked up largely in the in, in the context of uh, in the in the context of uh, infrastructure. But you see, till today, 
uh, no matter how much uh, the gender discourse has progressed by leaps and bounds, it's the right thing to lip sync. Everybody wants, everybody knows it's cool to say uh, that women are equal, uh, irrespective of what they believe. And like they say, everybody likes an empire. Everybody likes an empowered woman as long as she's next door. And, 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 and that's very, very true for the micro universes that we live in. Uh, but, the, but the principal question uh, in, in all of that uh, is, are we looking at structural barriers to equality? Are we looking at transformative financing for equality? Uh, and also, uh, are, are, we, uh, uh, are we mainstreaming these conversations? Uh, in institutions uh, where in places that we are. I think it's very important to progress from the conversation of participation, of representation to participation. I think, you know, we, we hog a lot on women's rep representation, which is very, very important. But does that effectively mean participation? Uh, and I think uh, that's a question we must ask ourselves. We have a very interesting example in this country from the 73rd and 74th Amendment of bringing more grassroots women into politics. And I can give you my own example from the UN. I've quoted this at so many places that it's almost boring for me, but I, I truly have to, uh, because it's the change that we've seen on that ground. Once you train women to occupy those spaces, 10 years back when we went into the ground, or even 15 years back when we went into the ground, to a small town in Rajasthan, we used to groom women, asking, uh, telling them, oh, they were the sarpanch and, you know, it, it, it depends on them on whether they want to sign it or not. But, uh, the, you know, this, this wonderful woman called Sunita, who was a sarpanch, then still had her palla till here, would come to me and say, Didi, I'm going to take a tea, my husband will talk to you. Ten years later, you know, in, uh, in, uh, it was a UNDP program. I was then in UNDP. Helen Clark was the administrative uh, uh, head of UNDP had come down to India and she said, I want to go visit a, 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 a site where you know the UN has worked on women in leadership. Uh, and of course, I, even having done a variety of interventions of that, we, we chose to take her to Rajasthan to look at women's participation in the panchayat. Uh, and we all had the Shadi Ka Mahal where there was dole to welcome her, there were garlands, and we walked almost a half a kilometer into the village. And when we reached there, uh, you know, we had a little munch which had two normal chairs that you would see in a, in a Shamiana or in a, in a typical Indian wedding. And we had one very big wing chair uh, in between. So naturally, Helen said, you know, Nishta, do you think I should be going on sitting on stage? I said, absolutely. The Sarpanch will join us uh, in just about a bit. Uh, and of course, coming from where we do, she, Helen went and sat on the wing chair. And we were waiting for Sunita and I sat in the chair next to her and we were waiting for Sunita and Sunita came on stage and she called me. She she She... she pointed out to me to walk down the street. So I went to her and said, Sunita ji, what are you talking about? Why are you not coming up? He said, Madam, who is in the chair, Helen ji, she is my chair. I am the Pradhan. She will tell you that she will be the Pradhan. She will be the Pradhan. So you see, it was a moment of complete joy and tears because, uh, you know, it does take time uh, to train women and to train men, to accept women as leaders, to for that voice to occupy that voice and choice and today you have sunita camp who campaign saying sarpanch main hu vote mujhe dijiye uh, and 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 when we today go to sunita's house uh, the husband is nowhere to be seen he's doing his own job he's not trying to be the sarpanch anymore so when you're working on gender stereotypes uh, when you're working on cultural conditioning of centuries we are going to take that amount of time and that is the you know investing in social norm change is going to be the greatest uh, uh, click in transitioning from law to implementation to practice. Because again, you can change everything, but if you don't change what goes on in the mind, you will hardly be able to change on, on what goes outside. I think we've got to a very, very cool place where we've made inequality at least look unacceptable. Today, if there is an incident in court where an awkward question is asked, it makes it to the newspapers. Uh, but at the same time, today when a report when when a rape is reported, you still see the victim's photograph with hands folded in front. So I think these paradoxes coexist in this country. It's about us trying to make one the norm and the other the exclusion. Uh, and it, it, it's uh, for me really uh, uh, the two biggest things that are going to help us to make that transition is investing in social norm change uh, and not treating it as a frill issue and to, to really target structural barriers of inequality, resisting the temptation to work on short-term measures and short-term changes, because indeed we're trying to question the oldest living institution in the world, which is patriarchy. 
Thank you, Nishtha. Thank you, Justice Menon, uh, for this insightful discussion. We have so much to think over, ponder over. And uh, before anything else, I just want to thank the both of you to, for taking our time from your extremely busy schedule and having this conversation with Anushka and I. And now I would like to call Tara Narula to give the vote of thanks. Thank you so much. I uh, would like to thank uh, Justice Menon and uh, Nishtha on behalf of the Delhi High Court Women Lawyers uh, Forum for sharing your stories and wisdom with us today. Uh, you helped in unpacking a lot of concepts uh, into practicality. It was a really enlightening session. I would also like to thank the moderators, Alia Waziri and Anushka Barwa for this wonderful session. And of course, thanks to our members who make it all happen, Nandita, Rinalni, Kritika, Sunita, Iram and Soumya as well. And of course, thank you to Live Law for covering the session and uh, streaming it live. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Likewise. Thank you, ma'am. All right, we can stop. <laughs>